when they become available. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about some, some brand new work on looking at uh, scaling at dynamic or quantum critical points by using uh, moments and, and cumulants of, of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so to motivate what this is, so dynamical quantum critical points or dynamical quantum phenomena has really come out in the last few years. Uh, really due to experimental realizations that uh, we have these experiments that demonstrate extremely precise control over quantum devices. Uh, the main examples here would be ultra cold atomic gases, uh, specifically in optical lattices, so the, the interesting cases, uh, at least for, for me, uh, and, and also trapped ions uh, that give rise to dynamical phenomena that you can't typically access in the condensed matter system, uh, partly due because we don't have enough control and also the time scales are, are very different. So they tend to be too fast in, in condensed matter to see very much. Um, so there are many examples in, in, in recent years, uh, but a common theme is that we can't use thermodynamics to describe these, or it's not obvious how to use thermodynamics to describe these. So we don't have a partition function and there's no free energy that we can we can immediately use so there's a key question here which is what aspects of universality can we find for dynamical systems uh, and then hopefully reuse some of what we know about universality uh, and thermodynamics to apply these to dynamical systems So first up, what do we mean by a phase transition or more, more uh, specifically, what do we mean by some kind of critical point? Uh, so conventionally, we, we define, uh, say, a thermodynamic phase transition via a, a partition function and a free energy. So our Z uh, is a function of, uh, sorry, is a summation over all microstates of a Boltzmann factor. Uh, and really our definition of a phase transition is that this will exhibit some kind of non-analytic behavior in the thermodynamic limit. So it's worth em emphasizing here that this is always going to be an analytic function for a finite system, because for a finite system, it's just a sum of exponentials here. So it's always going to be a function that exists everywhere uh, along along the beta axis, or you could generalize this to, to complex numbers if you like. So it will actually be a complex differentiable function that's, that's everywhere, everywhere continuous uh, for uh, a finite system, but for uh, in the thermodynamic limit, it becomes an infinite summation and we get the emergence of non-analytic behavior. Now we can apply something very similar actually for pure quantum states. So we can define a quantity here. Uh, this is actually the, the, the Loh Schmidt echo uh, in, in uh, many contexts as uh, an, an overlap uh, of some initial state with some time evolution operator, which can be, uh, we'll see examples actually, it's useful to, to do this in both imaginary and real time here. So this quantity is known as a boundary partition function. So uh, this, this quantity actually we'll call it G later on. This is very analogous to uh, how we define the free energy for uh, a, uh, in, in the ordinary case of a, of a partition function of, of a mixed state. So the scenario we're looking at here is we're going to do uh, dynamics of a closed quantum many body system. So we're going to ignore coupling to the environment. We'll assume that it can be neglected on, on the time scales that we're interested in. So the dynamics is purely unitary. So we're looking at a quantum quench uh, is probably the simplest scenario where we have our Hamiltonian parameterized by some control parameter lambda and we're going to prepare our system 
in some ground states. Uh, so we choose our, our Hamiltonian parameter lambda naught, prepare the ground state, and at time t equals zero, we suddenly quench that to a new value of, of lambda. And then we look at the, the time evolution of, of, of this state here. Uh, so our, our amplitude, uh, the z that we had before, our, our quantity that's analogous to our partition function then is going to be the overlap, the wave function overlap between our initial state and our time evolved state. Uh, so there's lots of names of this, of this function. Uh, so the Loschmidt echo is also used. So this is like uh, the, the modulus of this wave function overlap. We can also return it, call it the return rate or the return fidelity. And this amplitude here, this overlap is extensive in the number of degrees of freedom. That is the, the system size. Uh, so this is, this is kind of obvious, I think, for probably most people here who have looked at uh, infinite tensor networks that this overlap is going to be defined in terms of of some kind of transfer matrix uh, eigenvalue. So uh, the, the fidelity here is going to be some, some uh, eigenvalue to the power of my system size. Uh, hence, it makes sense to define this, to actually define the logarithm of this. So I can define the logarithm of this Loschmidt amplitude as this R of T, this, this rate function. Uh, so we can realize that using, using a matrix product uh, representation of my wave function. Uh, yeah, in, in which case our, um, our rate function is going to be determined by the eigenspectrum of this mixed transfer matrix between the two different wave functions, between the initial wave function and the wave function of my time evolved state. Uh, so then my rate function is going to be determined. Well, in general, I can expand my overlap uh, as a, a summation over uh, transfer matrix eigenstates of these, these capital lambdas here. Uh, and in the thermodynamic limit, uh, that overlap is going to be dominated by the leading eigenvalue of my transfer matrix of this lambda naught. So then I can, uh, for an infinite MPS, I can, I can actually calculate this rate function R of T very, very simply. In fact, it's going to be just be the negative log of the largest eigenvalue of uh, the, the transfer matrix of my uh, mixed transfer matrix between the two wave functions. Uh, so now we can uh, define somewhat tentatively define a, a dynamical uh, quantum phase transition as some kind of non-analytic behavior of this rate function of, of this Loschmidt amplitude now as a function of time. So what we have now is uh, a phase transition where we, we in, in some sense, we regard time as our control parameter. So as we evolve our system in time, what we're looking for now is non-analytic behavior of our rate function as my time variable increases. When I do some quench uh, of, of my, of my Hamilton, Ham, Hamiltonian parameter. So as an example of this, uh, the Ising model in a transverse field has been quite extensively studied. Uh, there are many exact results available. There's a, there's a really nice review paper from, from Marcus Hale uh, that looks quite extensively at the, at the Ising model. Uh, so in this scenario, well, we, there are many different ways we could do the quench, um, but the, uh, a typical way of doing this is to start from some kind of infinite field case so that my psi zero is, say, the, the eigenstate of all sigma x's. So I'm pointing in, in the sigma x direction which is then an equal weighted superposition of all spins up and, and all spins down. So this, this scenario is particularly easy to, to analyze. Uh, so then at t equals zero, we do a quench to some finite value of my field H. So if we actually do this and, and plot the rate function 
Damn, I thought I'd fix this. This should be the R of T. So this is the rate function that we introduced earlier. Then what we see is we see a, a, a periodic sequence of cusps. So if we if we go to H equals zero, then this is exactly perfectly periodic. Uh, so that, that case is quite easy to, to analyze analytically. But even if we do a quench to some other, some finite value of the field, then we still see periodic behavior, although my, my rate function, the value of my rate function is, is changing. Uh, but these, these cups, cusps, sorry, still remain uh, at perfectly periodic uh, intervals here. So this is really what we mean by, by a dynamical uh, a quantum critical point as a point where my um, where I get some non-analytic behavior here seen in, in the derivatives of my of my return rate. So then each DQPT is associated with a kink in this rate function. Uh, and we can treat that sort of very analogously to a, a, a critical point, a conventional critical point, a, a quantum critical point where we have some uh, power law scaling as we pass through the critical point. Now, something that's important to note here is that the fairly generic behavior we have is that the exponent associated with these dynamical quantum uh, critical points is equal to one. That is, we get linear behavior on either side of, of these cusps. Um, and I think until relatively recently, it was probably thought that this was maybe or suspected that this was maybe the only sort of possible behavior that you would get for uh, these kinds of dynamical uh, quantum critical points. Uh, although in 2D systems, you can see other cases as well. Uh, I personally haven't looked too much at 2D systems, but you can see some, some logarithmic uh, and people have seen some, some other other powers as well, but in in one D, I think until recently, people had only had only seen uh, this this linear behavior here. So the question is, what is the origin of this non-analytic behavior? Uh, again, it's it's very easy to analyze this from the point of view of infinite matrix product states. Uh, because each of these kinks is associated with a level crossing of our transfer matrix. So to understand uh, how, how this works, in fact, what we can do is calculate uh, not just the leading eigenvalue of our transfer matrix, but if we look at some of the, the, the higher uh, eigenvalues as well, uh, then we get this, this kind of behavior here. So this is the same plot as I had before, uh, it's, it's this one here. The difference is now, well, I've put it on a log scale so we can, we can see it a little bit better and I'm plotting some, some uh, higher eigenvalues as well. So what we can see now is that these cusps are just simply associated with a level crossing of my, of my transfer matrix eigenspectrum. So it makes sense actually to uh, treat the Loschmidt echo as a complex function and incorporate uh, imaginary time evolution into our protocol as well. So this hasn't been done so much when people have been looking at uh, uh, dynamical quantum critical phenomena, but it actually turned out as we'll see later, it turned out to be a really useful thing to do that it lets us analyze uh, the, the critical phenomena uh, much more much more easily. Sorry, I think I've just advanced this too much. Yeah. So we generalize now our um, our time step to to incorporate some imaginary time uh, beta as well. And what we're going to look at specifically is the the cumulants of this. So if we have our our, our function g of z analogous to um, our partition function as the expectation value of, of our time evolution operator, 
we can expand that as a power series of uh, where our prefactors are the cumulants, uh, which have related to the to the to the moments uh, to to the um, to the expectation values of the powers of of, of H. Uh, in fact, this is really the definition, in fact, of the cumulant generating function. Uh, so the logarithm, when we take the logarithm of this, we can expand our rate function as a power series in Z of, of our complex amplitude, where the prefactor of each term of our power series is exactly the cumulants. Now it's known, okay, so clearly for a, for a finite system, our G of Z is a sum of exponentials. So we can apply some complex analysis to this. Uh, we know that G of Z is an entire function and you can actually characterize it. In fact, it's essentially uniquely defined by the location of the zeros in the complex plane of my, my uh, G of Z essentially my, my, my boundary partition function. Uh, so this was analyzed in, the, in a famous set of papers, I think back in the 70s uh, from Fisher. So these are known as, as Fisher zeros. Uh, so then when we calculate the rate function uh, now as the logarithm of G, then I get these logarithms occurring here. So these are going to diverge. They're going to race off to infinity uh, and then these are known as, as Fisher zeros, so they're non-analytic points in, in my partition function. Now, if we take the thermodynamic limit, what we can do is we can treat this now as uh, instead, of a, instead of a summation here over my discrete zeros, discrete zeros of my uh, partition function, I can now treat that as an integral over the entire complex plane now of this row function here. So this row serves, we can think of it intuitively as a function that determines the density of, of Fisher zeros in that region of the complex plane. Um, but it's important to note, actually, this, this confused me quite a bit when I first started looking at this because I was looking for, for zeros of, of this function, but it's for an infinite system, for an infinite MPS, uh, this is defined as, as the leading eigenvalue of the transfer matrix. And the leading eigenvalue of our transfer matrix is just never going to be zero. Well, you can engineer some, some very special case where this goes to zero, but the, the generic behavior will never actually be zero. So why do people call these Fisher zeros? Well, the reason is because they are zeros in, in a finite system, but in a thermodynamic limit, um, those those disappear uh, and in fact these become something more like a branch cut uh, of in, in the complex function in, in complex space uh, so in fact it isn't a zero anymore but it's just simply a discontinuity of my rate function uh, in in the complex plane uh, so there's a really nice analogy now to 2d electrostatics uh, so we can treat this row of Z, it's um, as a density of zeros, we can actually treat this as uh, a charge density of a 2D of two dimensional electrostatics. Uh, so now of, of my rate function, we can think of that as the, as the complex potential. So then the real part of that is the, the electrostatic potential and the imaginary part of this or sorry, I should say discontinuities of the imaginary part of my, my rate function are associated with a finite region of charge density. Uh, and it's then it's possible we can have all of these analogies then to 2D electrostatics. For example, we can define the analogies, the, the analogous uh, electric field uh, now as the gradient of my, my potential. Uh, and using complex analysis, we can define that in terms of the complex derivatives of, of my rate function. So I should say these, these complex derivatives of the rate function are exactly the cumulants we saw earlier from our power series expansion uh, of, of my rate function. So really what I'm doing today is really just showing that we can actually calculate these derivatives 
directly using uh, using an MPS uh, formulation. So since we have um, uh, complex functions, we can apply complex analysis to it. So Stokes's theorem and Gauss's theorem on this electrostatic representation, in fact, just follow from the cauchy riemann conditions applied to the derivatives of the real and the complex, the real and imaginary parts of my rate function. Um, so we can see from that, if we apply actually the usual boundary conditions of, of electrostatic supply, that if I have some region of non-zero charge density, then the component of my electric field tangent to that discontinuity is continuous. Uh, but the component normal to that discontinuity is discontinuous. Uh, so this corresponds to then the real part of R being continuous. So that's my, my Loschmidt amplitude that we saw before. And the imaginary part, so that's the phase of this rate function, uh, is discontinuous. And this is quite important because most treatments, not all, but most treatments of dynamical quantum critical points haven't actually looked at the phase of the, the Loschmidt echo. And actually that turns out to be really quite important and we can get lots of interesting information from that. So now if we extend this notion of dynamical quantum phase transitions and critical points to consider my rate function in the entire complex plane. So this is actually very easy to calculate for an infinite MPS. We just need to do uh, two different time evolution uh, calculations and we can calculate uh, then the entire complex plane uh, of, of my rate function. So I do one set of, well, this is, this is one protocol, one possible protocol is we do one set of calculations which is the real time evolution from my initial state. And I do another set of calculations, which is the imaginary time evolution starting from my initial state. And what I want to calculate is my rate function at some point in the complex plane given by, by beta and time t. Uh, so I can calculate then that as the overlap between my uh, two different wave functions, a wave function at time t and a wave function at imaginary time beta. Uh, so we do essentially two n evolution steps, one set in real time, one set in imaginary time on, and from that we can calculate n squared data points, essentially the entire, the entire complex plane of the, uh, uh, the, the Loschmidt amplitude. So at first sight, now then, if we want to calculate expectation values of operators acting between different MPS, this would seem to be a not very well-defined kind of, kind of operation. So in this example, if we want to calculate, say, the, the expectation value of my Hamiltonian itself, well, this is an expectation value that's linear in system science. So the, the relevant quantity I've got is, say, something like, uh, the expectation value per site, um, uh, the energy per site, say. On the other hand, the overlap between these two wave functions is exponentially small. So if we look at what happens in the thermodynamic limit, then um, this expectation value would seem to have, well, okay, there's a linearly extensive part, which is the part we're interested in, but the overlap part is an exponentially small quantity that will dominate. So it seems that this expectation value just goes to zero. Um, on the other hand, if we want to calculate expectation values of these operators acting between the same uh, infinite MPS, this is quite a well understood problem. So there's an old paper, sorry, I forgot to put in the, 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 the reference there. Um, think back from back from 2007, and we've used this many times to analyze uh, scaling behavior um, at, at conventional quantum critical points. Uh, and uh, so there's a recursive algorithm which is described in that paper. I won't go into it today, uh, 
uh, so that given an, an MPO representation of h to the power n of, of uh, my Hamiltonian to the power of n, uh, we can calculate these cumulants in uh, essentially exactly from a, a recursive algorithm based on the, the MPO representation. Uh, so this is quite well understood now, I think, for, for operators acting between the same IMPS, where this expectation value is just a polynomial in my system size. So the prefactors of this polynomial are well defined in, in the large n limit. Uh, but it actually turns out that in, in some sense, I, I, I'm sort of kicking myself that I should have realized this years ago, uh, that the same algorithm with, with a very, very simple modification also works when we want to calculate logarithmic derivatives between expectation values of mixed uh, states. So say between uh, my psi at real time and, and psi of, of, of beta, as we had before. Uh, so this, uh, so these derivatives now of my rate function will I just plow through my derivatives because this is a logarithm. Uh, this pulls down a factor of the, the, the overlap into the denominator. So then this precisely cancels out the, uh, the divergence that we had where my expectation value would go to zero. So this quantity is actually well defined in the thermodynamic limit. And likewise, the, the higher derivatives as well, uh, give, given by the higher cumulants, are also well defined. Uh, so uh, that means that our, our old algorithm for calculating the cumulants uh, of, of powers of, of some operator uh, applies uh, directly to calculating these logarithmic derivatives between uh, uh, mixed MPS between different MPS just simply by changing the algorithm to scale my transfer matrix by the denominator, by the principal eigenvalue, this lambda. So that, uh, that means now that uh, if my, my sort of effective transfer matrix now really has an eigenvalue one now, because I'm scaling my transfer matrix, I'm dividing my transfer matrix through by the dominant eigenvalue. So by construction now, uh, the, the, the transfer matrix uh, my scale transfer matrix has an eigenvalue of one, and we see uh, this power law behavior emerge now in the thermodynamic limit. Okay. So now looking at these, uh, an example now where we look at the, the rate function in the complex plane, uh, this is now very easy to do using um, a combination now of the rate function plus the derivatives. Uh, so what I'm showing here now, so this is a, a very simple example uh, that the quench from h equals infinity to h equals 0 0.4, but that was one of the examples we saw earlier. Now just along the line beta equals zero. So the location of these Fisher lines now it coincides with the location of the, the cusps that we saw in, in the previous plot. Um, but this was actually very easy to obtain now because we can obtain the location of the cusps very easily uh, by looking at the derivatives. So we can find the location of the cusps from a discontinuity in the derivative. So the first cumulant. And we can also look for discontinuities in the phase that has, has been mostly neglected in in previous studies of these, uh, of the, these dynamical quantum phase transitions. And in particular, I haven't seen before, probably someone has done this, but I haven't actually seen, I haven't come across any literature that actually looks at these Fisher lines with respect to the, uh, to, to the phase and the discontinuity in phase. Uh, and this is quite relevant that we can see some quite interesting behavior here uh, and we'll see more of that in some, some examples later on. Uh, so our, our summary of um, then of what we can see for these, these Fisher lines in, in the complex plane. Well, so if a line crosses uh, the real part of Z equals zero, that, that is beta equals zero, uh, 
then it corresponds to a dynamical quantum phase transition. That is a non-analytic point as I do real-time evolution starting from my initial state. So the real part of my rate function is continuous, but it has cusps at the non-analytic points at these Fisher lines. So the imaginary part of the, the rate function is discontinuous at the Fisher line. And the, the change in the imaginary part corresponds to the charge density. So going back to this plot here, we can interpret this now as a problem of uh, 2D electrostatics, where the, the phase, the discontinuity in the phase is essentially now uh, my charge density. So we can see that we've got a very high charge density. In fact, it's an angular quantity, so it actually wraps around, it wraps around 2 pi um, here, and it goes to zero essentially at the, at the extremes of beta going to, to uh, plus and minus infinity. Uh, so from this point of view, it becomes much easier to analyze uh, the, these Fisher lines. So for example, we can identify the, the discontinuities quite easily from the first cumulant, because this corresponds now to the gradient of my rate function. Uh, and what's very useful um, for, finding, uh, for finding these curves here. So for finding these curves here, we want to find that where the discontinuities actually join up, where they form a continuous line, uh, and we can do that quite easily because we can find the curve, the tangent curve of the Fisher line at any point uh, at when, whenever we find any crossing uh, in the complex plane. So once we have identified uh, a crossing point as a discontinuity, say along some axis, say along the time axis, we can calculate the tangent curve along, along that one there. So for example, this tangent curve would be a line. Um, sorry, I can see if I can draw a line here. Would be say like this tangent curve at some point here would be this line going along that way. So we can calculate that tangent point at. We can calculate that that tangent line at uh, the point on the crossing there. So that makes it very easy as well as just identifying. The location of the crossing point, we can identify the slope of the Fisher, the Fisher line at that point, uh, which is very useful. Uh, okay. Uh, we can also calculate uh, the, the curvature of the Fisher line. So this now involves the second cumulant. I won't write down the expression. It, it's fairly, it's fairly com complicated but uh, we can calculate curvatures and so on and so forth. But if you wanted to calculate some, uh, some, some, some higher moments of the curvature, then we can do that from the, the, the higher cumulants. Okay, so as an aside here, I'll just make a note that uh, there's a really interesting series of papers um, from Piotr and co-workers, uh, so these the group in Finland, for calculating these Fisher zeros for finite size systems. Um, so there's a there's a basically a screen grab here from 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 uh, their, their most recent paper, I think the most well developed one, where for a finite system, uh, you calculate n cumulants at some point in in the complex plane. And those cumulants contain approximate information about all of the nearby Fisher zeros. Uh, so if you calculate some, some fairly large number of cumulants, then they have a procedure, they developed an algorithm, at which point you can calculate the approximate location of the zeros from, from those cumulants. And because it's a finite system, they are genuine zeros. So they are genuine discontinuities in, in this, this logarithm. Uh, and essentially from the power series expansion of um, the rate function at some point, you can then do uh, sort of equate the, equate the, 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 the prefactors from uh, an expansion in terms of the zeros of, of, uh, the, of the rate function. Uh, so if you do this for a variety of system sizes, the Fisher zeros 
coalesce into curves here. So uh, in the plot here, they've got a variety of, of different finite sizes from I think eight up to about 20 or so. Um, I've forgotten what model this is. Actually, I think this is a, this is a tie of chain in 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 one D. Uh, so this is a, a quite laborious procedure here, actually. So you need to do this for multiple system sizes, and you need to identify the Fisher lines from where these zeros coalesce into a into a continuous curve. Uh, and certainly, in the case where they've got interactions here, I think it's quite unclear exactly what those Fisher lines are actually doing. In, in that limit. Uh, so the, the infinite MPS, I think, is a far superior approach. And in particular, the phase information, you actually can't even get the phase information from just looking at finite size systems, because uh, the phase is defined per site. So for a large finite size system, then this all, this all kind of uh, disappears. Uh, I know I'm just out of time, just about out of time. So I really actually want to get onto the meat of this which is looking at the, uh, the, the three-state POTS model. Uh, I'll, I'll skip that one. So from finite size DMRG, there's a, there's a nice paper from Christian Karash uh, that identifies cusps in here um, that actually develop at later times. So uh, at early times, there, there's no cusps, but they, they tend to develop later, but the exponent seems to be always one. Um, so there's a later work from um, uh, there's a later work from from uh, Yan Tao Wu actually who identified that if you look just at the point where these cups emerge, you actually get a non-trivial uh, exponent here that you get this exponent one half uh, critical point here. Um, so an RG analysis showed that these emerge from the boundaries where these cups emerge. Uh, so the new result now is if we look at these Fisher lines in the complex plane, we can identify these locations where the cusps emerge as these endpoints of the, the Fisher line. So the Fisher lines terminate at some point in the complex plane. And if you arrange it such that they terminate at uh, the point where you're looking at, say, at, at beta equals zero, then that corresponds to a dynamical quantum uh, phase transition with some non-trivial exponent, exponent half in this case. Uh, so we can see that emerge uh, if we do a zoomed in view of this first one here. So the later ones we can see clearly there's linear behavior. So the exponent is equal to one. If we zoom in just on that first non-trivial one, uh, then we can see then that that has uh, an exponent of a half. And if you look at the phase of this, this is associated now with a discontinuity in the phase at that point. So it's right at the point where this would become a discontinuity, where that discontinuity goes to zero, but the derivative of that diverges. And we can see that from looking at the second cumulant. Uh, so um, I also have a slide here on these double cusps, which is a new phenomena, but uh, I'm out of time here, so I think we'd just better skip to the conclusions uh, and uh, happy to take some questions about this. Thank you for a nice talk. Okay, is there any comment or question? Okay, I have a very fundamental question about the uh, definition of dynamic critical phenomena. Yep. Rosemitt echo depends on the initial state. So right. it means uh, may, maybe if there is a universality class of DQC, so it depends on the initial state or something. Right, yes, this is true. This is true. So this is, this is a key question in looking at these dynamical critical phenomena. Now, so there are some exact results for the Ising model, for example. Um, so if we go back to, um, if we go back to this one, it's known for the Ising model in particular, um, that I think the, I think the result would be basically that these Fisher lines are continuous. They extend from beta minus infinity to beta plus infinity. 
Um, so think then that it actually doesn't matter what your initial state is. And in fact, uh, you see um, the emergence of these cups if you cross the, the, the critical point at h equals zero. So if you cross, um, so if you do this plot from h equals infinity to h smaller than zero, you see these cusps. If you do h bigger than zero, you don't anymore. And actually this is generically true. So if you do a, a quench from any h bigger than zero to any h less than zero, you see these cusps, at least in the Ising model. Um, now, I think this is because these Fisher lines, in this case, extend to infinity in both directions. Uh, so if you think it doesn't really matter, so we can deform our initial state, which is what we're doing with the, with the imaginary time of Richard, we can deform our initial state and it doesn't change our, uh, it doesn't change at least qualitatively our dynamical behavior. Um, but I think that's probably not universal because if you, if you do this for the POTS model, if you we deform our initial state, then yes, we get very different behavior when we do that. Yeah, so I think that's the initial state is 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 definitely key. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Oh, I see. It's a very different for the conventional equivalent uh, critical points. So. Yes. 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 It is. I, it is. I think um, the Ising model calculations I think are a little bit misleading because if you do some nice analytics and some RG. Mm -hmm and show that this is equivalent to uh, like the, the conventional Ising critical point. Well, actually it's, it's like the, the, the 1D classical um, Ising model. Uh, but I think that's maybe a little bit misleading that, that this behavior is, is probably not universal. Okay, thank you. So is there any question? Oh, please, Nishino-san. Okay. Uh, dealing with the complex number, uh, I have a technical uh, question on MPS treatment of the MPS. Is there any difficulty, any uh, additional difficulty to uh, treat complex number uh, rather than real number in MPS operation, numerical operation? I mean, uh, not really. So when when we do infinite MPS, we tend to use complex numbers anyway, even if we expect everything to be real. Um, because actually, if you look at the manifold of, of MPS, if you look at the manifold of real MPS, it's actually discontinuous. So there are regions of, of um, uh, there are MPS, real MPS that you can't actually continuously transform just using purely real numbers. You need to use complex. Uh, so we generally use complex numbers anyway. Uh, and yeah, there's no, I don't know of any particular problems. Actually, they make it easier. I, I'd say there's, there's problems doing, or you can get into problems using with, with IMPS if you try and use purely real arithmetic. Okay, uh, I have a question about Please. the concept. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah yes. Okay. Um, so, so I feel the complex analysis is just want to find the long analytically about the partition function or other potentials. Uh, if we put time into into beta, for me it's a it's a tool for it, but we we definitely call it dynamical visualization here. Yeah. Uh, for what, what's your question? Um, so for me, um, I think you, if you uh, become beta into a complex number, you plus yep. it. Right. I think it's true to treat uh, the um, long analytical of the partition function. It's just want to find the phase transition, but to uh, t, so we call it a dynamical phase transition. For me, it's, it's the same in a way for the Li Yang zeros. It's just want to find right. the, the zeros or whatever uh, long analytical the distribution in the complex planes. So it's right. also, it, it's a method for analyzing the phase transition. So for me, it's, um, it's just a form of phase transition. So you call it a dynamic of transition. It's, is real time evolution, is due to time evolution, there is a transition, or just you want to find the, 
arranging now phase transition in the arranged the Hamiltonian. Yeah, yeah. So it's it, it, it's it's close, very closely related to just looking at Fisher zeros of a of a conventional phase transition. So in the Fisher zero formalism, you generalize you're, you're looking at a, a, a phase transition with respect to temperature. So you're looking along the beta direction. Um, but now you generalize your beta to to have an imaginary part. So you you then do well, what's effectively like a real time evolution. Uh, and then you can look at the lines in this direction. Yeah, yeah. So it's it, it's it's very it's very closely related here. We're just like turning everything ninety degrees, if if you like. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is there any other question? Oh, please, uh, sure, um, please. Uh, if I may, uh, uh, time is still allowed. Uh, okay. Yeah. So a very very basic question. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, at the beginning, when you mentioned that um, the, the, this cusp is related to the crossing of the leading eigenvalue, and in the plot, yeah. I see that kind of the leading eigenvalue that you calculate between mixed transfer metrics can be way larger than one. Uh, I don't actually understand like that plot. Um, oh, sorry, that, that that's the logarithm, the negative logarithm of that eigenvalue. Uh, okay. the, eigen, the eigenvalue itself is between zero and one. So yeah. we take the negative log of that, so that's from uh, essentially zero to infinity. Okay, I see. I see. Thanks. Okay. 